Why, hello there, it is 28 days until Elden Ring comes out on February 25th, 2022, and this is the Elden Week Countdown. Today I will be talking about the latest PlayStation blog interview as well as the latest Elden Ring tweet. Let's get into it. And before we get going, I wanted to quickly address the elephant in the room, which is the Game Informer coverage for Elden Ring that also dropped today. I think even now as I'm recording, Dan Tack is doing a stream on the Game Informer Twitch where he is fielding questions and answering stuff about his 10 hours with Elden Ring. And I got about five minutes into the stream before I personally had the duck out. I like hearing stuff like interviews and getting a good idea of what the devs want to accomplish with the game and their goals and sort of the experience they want you to have. But I felt like the information was too detailed for me and even covering it would just feel like a laundry list of naming NPCs and areas and I had to duck out. So as we go into this final month, the channel will probably cover less of the news and I'll probably be going a little quieter on that end, but I'm still going to continue to post up daily videos about the item descriptions and hopefully with all the new information, it doesn't vastly change people's understanding of those items and we can continue to speculate and have a good time. But let's get into the PlayStation blog interview. What I've done here is I've pulled out a few notable quotes and some particular points of the interview that I thought were interesting. The first quote I wanted to pull out was the question asking Miyazaki how he wanted players to come to Elden Ring. And Miyazaki said, if possible, we want players to try and steer clear of spoilers or guides and go in with a completely fresh, open mind and enjoy that initial sense of adventure. That's how we'd want to experience the game if we were going into it the first time, and that's how we hope our players can experience the game comfortably at their own pace with this new sense of wonder. And I really like this, and not to hammer this in, but that is partially also why I backed out of the Game Informer information, because I heard things that I thought would change how I play the game because I would know something about the progression that I didn't want to know, and that would just tarnish the experience for me, forgive the pun, but I just didn't want to do that, and it seems like Miyazaki is probably in the same boat. The next interesting quote is about Miyazaki answering what he learned about making a sprawling open world game. And Miyazaki said elements like balancing the player's exploration alongside boss fights, the order of progression that the players go through the game, and the progression of events themselves through the map, trying to expand on player freedom while balancing all of this was a significant challenge but we learned many great lessons attempting to achieve this. And this next point is something we already kind of know, but the interviewer asked Miyazaki about what influence Sekiro had on Elden Ring, and Miyazaki basically said that being developed alongside Elden Ring, Sekiro didn't directly affect it, but influenced elements like the stances, player traversal, and using a similar approach to providing a more direct story while still keeping the fragmented approach to the lore and the greater world. And a small tidbit is that it seems like the deprived class for Elden Ring is called the Wretch. The interviewer asked Miyazaki about the difficulty of Elden Ring, and Miyazaki said that they have not made Elden Ring easier, but they've provided more freedom in how you approach situations and more routes to take in the world to allow players to come back to tough challenges when they're more prepared. And the interviewer asked Miyazaki about the more vibrant and colorful world of Elden Ring, and Miyazaki said about that that we wanted to give a sense that a golden age had passed through the world and that the player can still see traces of it. We wanted to provide the world with a much more painterly look to invoke a high fantasy feeling as a theme. And then the interviewer asked Miyazaki about the approach to designing bosses and characters in Elden Ring, citing that Dark Souls there was this level of dignity but also horror, and Miyazaki said, in Elden Ring, we wanted to take a slightly different approach because we had these brand new characters that George R. R. Martin wrote alongside the setting and mythos he provided for the world. He created these very heroic and grandiose designs, essentially these demigods from the history of Elden Ring's world. So we wanted to take what he provided us and create a new core for these characters and how we designed them. From the boss designs that we've revealed so far, the one I feel is a good match for how we take a heroic concept and twist and misshape it due to the power of the Elden Ring shards is Godric the Grafted. He is an excellent example of this because he encompasses that feeling of sadness and frustration when a lord comes to the end of his reign, trying to cling desperately to the power he still has left. In this way, Godric is a great embodiment of that new design approach. 
And finally in this interview, the interviewer asked Miyazaki what he would want to say to players as they're getting into Elden Ring. And Miyazaki said, We want players to concentrate on the sense of adventure the game provides. We hope players discover the simple joy of exploration when playing and that they can approach it on their own way at their own pace. That's what I hope. And I really liked those insights that the PlayStation blog gave. A lot of it was stuff we'd kind of heard, but hearing about the more painterly approach because of the fantasy setting, as well as how they sort of shifted their focus when it came to boss designs was very interesting. And I really liked the emphasis of adventure. That's the main thing from all these Miyazaki interviews that I'm getting. It's a sense of adventure and tackling it at your own pace and making it this real personal experience. And now we have the latest Elden Ring tweet and the tweet is captioned with, Many great champions have accepted her gentle, final embrace. I think that sounds pretty ominous. The big question is, who is she? Her cloak hides a lot of her features, including one of her eyes, and it seems like maybe her visible eye is golden, but otherwise there isn't much to go off of from her appearance. She could be Merica, but I think that is unlikely. The ominous tone I think fits there, but Merica has been so mysterious that I don't think they just drop her right here, and this setting doesn't feel quite right for the god queen of the lands between. She could also be a finger maiden that Miyazaki recently mentioned that is also in the game. The champions accept her gentle final embrace, so she offers champions something. It sounds kind of like the accord that Melina offers us. Now Melina is not a finger maiden, but she is assuming the role and there are some similarities between the two that make me think she could be a finger maiden. And obviously she could and probably is someone unknown at this point, but I would also like to offer a bit of an offbeat option C. I think that she could be Saint Trina or one of her followers. My reasoning is that the ominous, gentle, final embrace bit reminded me of the way the items in the network test having to do with Saint Trina and sleep are worded in the tone that they have. The sleep pot says filled with the incantations of St. Trina, like a lullaby or a quagmire, it irresistibly draws its victims down into sleep. Sweet dreams. Trina's arrow says the peace of deepest slumber can be so very hard to resist. And finally, the moon egg says owl eggs that will never hatch, prized as a symbol of the most sublime slumber. It is likely that the ominous tone of the item descriptions are just similar to the ominous tone for the caption, but given that she is sitting on a bed and they all have this comfortable and deadly vibe, I thought I would throw it out there. I also wanted to point out a few small details. The candelabras look like a flower in this room, and not to keep hammering this, but St. Trina's lily is the symbol of her faith. That being said, they don't exactly look like Trina's lily. The other item I wanted to mention is that the picture frame on the right hand side is the same design as the picture frame in the image with the Crucible Knight and this mysterious masked lady. It is likely that it is just a reused frame model, but I figure it is worth mentioning. And there you have it, day 28, we are getting into the final four weeks. It is four weeks until we have Elden Ring in our hands and I just can't get over that. It is going to be something of a hectic remaining four weeks because if we got so much information and there's so much stuff floating around with Dan having shared stuff, I don't even know what to expect out of the potential of UK based creators, like a dozen of them also getting time with the game and then having a dozen different impressions flooding the internet. So I won't be covering all of that stuff, but I will continue to do item descriptions, which I will continue doing tomorrow. And we will just hype our way to the release of Elden Ring, which is coming up very soon. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving a like, and if you want more item descriptions and maybe a little bit of news coming up to the release of Elden Ring, and then you want lore content and discussions following the release, please consider subscribing to The Lore Hunter. Thanks for watching.